So uh, I was delighted to see uh, the front page uh, the headliner of National Geographic because um, they actually did pay an awful lot of reverence to the soil organism as opposed to just being topsoil that has kind of an inert quality or character to it that's merely supposed to hold plants upright. So uh, it's very encouraging to see that it's getting the recognition that you know folks like yourself have given it for more than a few years. So when we're dealing with these <coughs> organisms within organisms, superorganisms, what we're dealing with here, we, and this is kind of things that I talk with my farmers all the time, start thinking about soil as ecosystems within ecosystems. So we have, you know, we have what we call the lithosphere, uh, which is the mineral component or portion of the soil. We have the hydrosphere, which is the fluids, predominantly water, which I'm going to talk about. Um, we have the biosphere, which are all the inhabitants, the living biological inhabitants of this ecosystem. And then we have the atmosphere, which are the gaseous <coughs> byproducts of exchanges between the inorganic and the organic uh, realm. Uh, one of my teachers um, back in the late 70s and early 80s was a, a fairly renowned agronomist by the name of Don Schriefer uh, from uh, Lamont, Indiana, and uh, who's since passed from the scene. And Don wrote two books that were published by Acres USA. One is called From the Soil Up, and the other one was called Agriculture and Transition. And he was primarily a, a crop agronomist, but he also worked with people growing hort and, hort and uh, orchards and, and livestock. Um, being in the Midwest, most of his clientele were the folks that were corn and bean, wheat, and hay farmers. But he was always emphasizing you got to basically take the pulse of your landscape. Take the pulse of your landscape like you're a physician taking the pulse of your patient and ask yourself basically the question of what are your yield limiting factors? What are your yield limiting factors? And so he said that you know, essentially you have to look at it from the standpoint of what biology really depends on first and foremost, secondarily, and then downstream. And what he was saying was that <clears throat> the very first thing you have to deal with is managing your atmosphere because uh, essentially the most important nutrient in the soil isn't nitrogen or calcium, phosphorus and such, it's oxygen because it's an aerobic. And so aerobic ecosystems, of course, first and foremost depend on the 21% oxygen that's in the atmosphere, but in the soil the atmosphere is a little lower, it's about maybe 15% in a healthy aerobic environment. And that's, of course, where you see the fence post always rotting, right, in that top four inches, which is where the aerobic zone is. And what the, the, the objective here is to try to get that four inch pe fe fence post rotting zone down another foot, maybe deeper. You know, not that you want your fence post to rot that completely, but you know, <clears throat> if, you use, if you use locust, you won't have to worry about that, right? So the number one is atmosphere. And then once you start managing atmosphere, you have a chance to manage water. Because if you have atmosphere, it means you have pore space. You have pore space, you have infiltration opportunities. So then you manage water, and that's also a manage of, of carbon. <laughs> But actually, you can't really manage carbon unless you have digestion, which is another word for decay. So you have to manage digestion, which is basically pulsing the root systems, getting the organic uh, residues to, to decompose instead of burning them. I was reading, uh, realized now that in Australia, one of the farm papers I saw at the airport, you know, there seems to be more emphasis on, on stubble mulching, you know, getting your stuff ground up so that there's more surface area so that the fungi, the bacteria can start breaking down these carboniferous residues from your previous crop, so there's more emphasis on that. And last but not least is fertility. And, you know, when you look at a lot of people who recommend uh, how to grow a crop, you know, and I was one of them once upon a time, it was fertility first. Whether you're an NPK manager or you're looking at other elements like calcium, phosphorus, zinc, whatever it might be, and it's not that fertility is of least consideration, it's that you can't really get good fertility uh, returns on your investment if you don't have a good ecosystem that's Im embodied with the right kinds of atmosphere, the digestion, and the um, <coughs> water management issues. So I don't know if <coughs> all of you have one of these. I think every farm should have one of these tools because this is a measure of compaction and the depth of the compaction called the plow pan or the hard pan, in some cases what we call the fragile pan, which is a geological pan. Uh, but what I call this is, is an oxygen meter. That, not that it measures oxygen, what it's measuring is pounds per square inch. And what I like about this tool tells me exactly what the PSIs are and where the PSIs start to get deep. So if I start getting into that red zone, which is getting into the 300 pounds per square inch zone, what that says to me right now is root growth starts to halt abruptly. 
because roots don't want to grow into an anaerobic environment because there's no life there, at least not the aerobic life that uh, aerobic plants depend upon. So that tells me exactly where <coughs> my pans are, depth-wise, because there's uh, demarcations on the rod. And it tells me specifically how tight the pans are. And then I can also find out how thick the pans are. So how deep, how tight, and the thickness of that pan. And sometimes, basically, what I see in, I'd say, 90-plus percent of my clients, and a lot of these guys are livestock with perennial polycultures of grass and meadows, we have a lot of compaction. Now, in my country, that ground that's currently being managed, let's say, with a perennial polyculture, has been plowed for 300 years, albeit with horses, but horses and plows compact soil. Cows walking on top of ground compact soil. And then we end up coming up with heavier equipment. Now the guys that are mechanized, you know, more, <coughs> more machinery, more horsepower, and we have more compaction. Then throw in salt fertilizers, throw in fungicides, herbicides, and all kinds of sides except suicide, perhaps, and you end up with a dead zone that really does interfere with the efficiency of your fertility program in a big, big, big way. I mean, this is a huge issue with drought. Huge issue with drought. And most people say, I, I don't understand. I spent all this money on lime and, and rock phosphate and foliar sprays. And, you know, we just can't seem to get the return on investment. And the reason why is because you don't have the number one fertility uh, being taken care of, which is oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, what good is calcium? If you don't believe that, put a plastic trash bag over your head and go down to McDonald's and see how long you can last. You know, so, so there's actually <clears throat> these key line subsoilers now are being made in Pennsylvania uh, by a Mennonite machine shop, being pulled by drafts. <laughs> now, they only pull one shank at a time with six animals, you know, because the ground is tight, but we actually have uh, the key lines being manufactured in Whitehorse, Pennsylvania, as I speak, and uh, the guys that have draft animals are picking up on this. They even have uh, gentils over there that are mechanized on a platform being pulled by six. It's like the airway system that punches holes in the ground. <clears throat> so this is one of the reasons why this kind of buffalo model or bison model became important because when you start mobbing animals and getting this residue to get incorporated with dung and urine <clears throat> and then, of course, very importantly, rest, you can actually start activating uh, the destruction of the pans, albeit a little slower, but with biological inputs instead of steel. All right? and, and once upon a time, this was being done in England in 1896 uh, by the Clifton Park system, where they had hard pans in the UK that was started 2,000 years ago because the British started farming the UK 2,000 years ago. And they did it with plows. And they ended up creating plow pans. So what they ended up doing was they found out these hard pans were 14 inches deep, and the thickness was a foot. That's a thick pan. But that's 2,000 years of farming. That's what will get you. So how do you fracture these pans? They didn't have gentils, and they didn't have yeoman subsoilers. So what they did is they used plants, because plants of certain persuasions have an ability to dissolve the pans. And these were the ones that they found out that had the biggest effect on dissolving the pans were chicory, burnet, and lucerne. So when we look at why this happens, again, now we're getting back into the biosphere. Now we're dealing with the, the, uh, the biosphere instead of the lithosphere. The lithosphere is basically compacted clays and such. We're looking at the example of ryegrass. Now this is a winter cereal, an annual, and the work that was done by uh, Dittmer, University of Iowa, around 1935-36, right, this was work where they actually took a four-month-old annual cereal rye plant exhumed it out of a good soil, and then microscopically as well as macroscopically looked at the uh, mileage length of roots. And what they found out in a four-month-old annual cereal rye plant, they had between six and 7,000 miles of actually roots and root hairs and sub-root hairs and root hairs that have to be only seen with a microscope. One plant, an annual. But so here you're talking about a huge logarithmic kick in terms of root system. So if you're talking about 7,000 miles of roots, with an annual, what are you getting with a perennial that never dies, that's never, you know, leaving the system? You're talking about unquantifiable mileage of root systems, and all of those root systems produce. So you get into the prairie, now we're dealing with warm season grasses. Now, you guys have your own versions over here, and I've been enjoying 
uh, doing a little bit of emailing back and forth with Colin Sice, who's using your native warm season grasses, which I'm not familiar with. But over here in, in the United States, we have things like big blue stem, little blue stem. This is switchgrass. This is some of the work's being done uh, at the Land Institute to try to create perennial grains, although it's going to probably be two or three decades before they finally get there. But what I like about these guys is that, that root system there, you look at this fibrous mat, that's, that's 17 feet deep, that root. So when you have 17 foot deep root systems, man, you're talking about a lot of biology, you're talking about a lot of moisture, you're talking about a lot of carbon, you're talking about a lot of surface area, you're talking a lot of, you know, basically air. So now we're talking about pu pumping 17 feet of root. And if you want to read a great book that changed my life when I was in college, because I was a very discouraged ag student in college, uh, it's Malabar Farm by Lewis Bromfield. Out of the Earth was another book he wrote, and Pleasant Valley was another book he wrote. How they renovated a thousand acres of completely destroyed land that had no topsoil left. And how they grew as much as six to eight inches of, of topsoil in as many years using root systems of perennial crops. And those, in those days it was predominantly not warm season grasses, but lucerne uh, and brome and, and ladino clover. Those were the three big that they actually reclaimed that farm with. So when we're dealing with these microbes that we don't even understand, we have robots on Mars looking for microbes. So I love that one. And yet we've, we've only identified less than 5% of the microbes now on the planet. And we only estimate that there's maybe <clears throat> 3 million species of bacteria, half as many species of fungi, and we don't know who they are. Except that, you know, we know that they do something. You know, that's the same is true with uh, human biology or human medicine, animal medicine, animal biology, in massive numbers of organisms. And as a matter of fact, you know, last night I said about your 10 trillion cells. Well, multiply that by 10, that's the number of organisms that live on you and in you. No different from plant systems. The phylosphere, which is the leaf surface, inhabited by many, many organisms, which is how you're able to ensile, you know, your forages if you're making baleage or grass silages, because there's natural inoculants that live on the leaf of these, or of these, of these organ organisms we call plants. These are numbers that have been looked at many, many times. This is a slide that's been replicated by different universities many times. But what I find interesting about this, you see the average pounds per acre foot? You add these all up and you realize you have as many livestock in the soil underneath the pasture or the paddock as you do have livestock on the top. It's a massive weight of organisms. And they're not operating independently. They're all in a community. These are communal organisms that need one another. There's a codependency here, a coevolutionary kind of dependency here that's incredibly critical to grow the carbon that we're talking about. My microbes make up 50% of the Earth's total biomass. And that includes counting the uh, microbes in the ocean. Uh, there's more microbial cells on the Earth's surface than stars in the universe. I don't know who counted that. It wasn't somebody like me, that's for sure. 80% of all of our biodiversity is microbial. There's more microbial cells, I just said this, in humans and on humans and animals and plants than cells comprising them. So this is a graph I'm sure many of you have seen, and this basically represents in a model, kind of like the Serengeti, where you have prey or herbivores, then you have cats, you know, the predators, and then you have the super predators. So what's happening here? We'll see the carbon and nitrogen ratios. <clears throat> These are mostly nitrogen or protein. Now we're getting uh, higher carbon organisms and yet higher carbon organisms, and everybody's eating everybody, at least from the top down. Just like, you know, wolves eating bison, big cats eating ungulates on the Serengeti. The, the consequence of that is that the consumption of high protein diets creates a lot of high protein poo. High protein food is a resource now for more high protein organisms. That's how you grow microbial organisms in the rumen. That's how you grow high quantities of high protein bacteria in the root ball. And so as you create more food, you create more predators to eat that food, these guys. As these numbers increase, their predators start to increase, which are the predatory nematodes, the predatory mites, and these other arthropods that live on the top. All of these are constantly recycling nitrogen, and as they decompose and die, what are they made up of? Look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio, much higher. So they're building carbon merely by having a lifespan as they eat you know, the prey below them. This is Lumbricus terrestris, an alien species to North America. I'm sure he's an alien species here. It's a European earthworm. And I'm going to talk about earthworms uh, in the next talk in a lot more detail because I don't think people really respect this guy. Like Rodney Dangerfield, this is the Rodney Dangerfield of the Earth. 
gets no respect. Nobody really knows. They, they know they're good. I know there's earthworm farms. I know there's all earthworm casting businesses. But people don't realize just how important. And what I like about the earthworm is I can go to a farmer and say, look, you don't need a microscope. You know? You need a shovel, right? And sometimes you need a couple of electric probes if it's, you want to get them out of the ground. Or a little bit of, uh, you know, sulfuric acid diluted way down and get them out of the subsoil. And count. You can count, right? I mean, it's a matter of kind of like 1 to 30. It's like arithmetic, not algebra or calculus. And you start doing some math here. And the math is, if you can find basically 25 worms per cubic foot, a foot square, a foot deep, we're talking about a million worms per acre. And a million worms per acre, based on 2,000 worms giving you 125 pounds of castings, which is this manure from worms, will give you 62,500 pounds of castings per acre per year. That's 30 tons of worm manure. That's pretty significant, 30 tons of good worm manure, which doesn't burn crops. It doesn't create too much potash in the forage. You know, it doesn't tie up other nutrients because the salt levels are too high. It's perfect. Perfect. So they eat a third of their body weight a day. The healthy population will move 20 tons of soil per acre per year. They can burrow eight feet deep, which means I've got air going down eight feet with Lumbricus terrestris. That's what I'm looking for is oxygen, as deep as I possibly can get it. Because when I have oxygen, what I have is a wicking system now. You have a kerosene lamp, you know that wicking is a defiance of gravity, right? So what I have when I have roots going down 8 feet deep or 16 feet deep, I have wicks that actually move moisture from my subsoil during the drought up into my topsoil as I create carbon and oxygen, this pulsing system that I have, and earthworms are running up and down. The earthworms, I actually tell farmers in our neck of the woods, are kind of a hybrid between a, a, a chicken and a cow. And what I mean by that is they actually are uh, doing what uh, a cud-chewing animal does, and what they do is, you, if you look at an earthworm, uh, I don't know if you ever observe them at nighttime, nightcrawlers obviously come out at night, and, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll take a leaf, always intelligently enough, I don't know if you ever dissected an earthworm, they have a brain, right, and uh, they have a gizzard, like a chicken does, and <clears throat> what they do is they, they pull that leaf in, always stem first, by the way, right, a congressman couldn't do that, <laughs> I can tell you that right now, they always pull the leaf in stem first, right, and then they grind it up with a gizzard, which is a high lignified leaf. Lig li there's not a lot of value in, in leaf, especially an oak leaf. It's lignified, no protein there to speak of. High, high in uh, cellulose and lignin. And they grind it up with their gizzard, and they mix it up with all this mucilage in their digestive tract, and then they regurgitate it. Who does that? Ruminants do that, right? They regurgitate it, except their, their cud is outside of their bodies, and they slime the burrow with this cud. And they wait for temperature and moisture to optimize, and what do they end up growing in that Petri dish? Yeast and bacteria, which are high in protein. So they create protein out of something that had no protein in it, merely by inoculating a Petri dish, an agar plate, if you will, you know, with their own regurgitant, <clears throat> and allowing moisture and the actual inoculi that are in the atmosphere to land on that agar plate and grow yeast and bacteria, which is where they get their protein from. Amazing. You know, when you're looking at the types of soils you have, it's based on whether or not you have this percentage of silt, that percentage of clay, this percentage of, of sand, and then everything that's an aggregate that holds it together, hopefully, hopefully, humus. So when we're talking about surface area, we're talking about trying to create, and I, you know, and I know most people curse clay because clay, when it's not cooperating with you can be asphalt parking lots. It can be incredibly difficult. But I'll take a clay soil that I can remediate any day over a sandy soil that takes me a long time, almost never able to remediate, particularly a sandy soil that's got a CEC of around two to three. Because it's really, really difficult to get surface area, which is habitat, right? People, things, animals live in homes. You need habitat. And so what this is is a, is a high school experiment showing how do you create surface area? How does nature create surface area? This is called the Koch snowflake. You know, superimposing triangles eventually give you, you know, this coastline. And the state of Maine is an example of that. So if you drive from Portland down here up to New Brunswick, Canada, that's 300 miles. If you walk along this irregular coastline as a human, it's 3,000 miles. What if you're a dog? What if you're an ant? <clears throat> what if you're a microbe? How far is that regular coastline? You see where I'm getting at? It's nature's way of creating infinity within a finite constraint. That's, that's the Coke snowflake thing. 
So enormous surface area is what colloidal chemistry is all about. You know, we make, um, we make uh, natural fertility products using an organic surfactant, and what we create in there is called a micelle, which is a colloidal cluster, allowing that <clears throat> particulate to have more reactivity opportunity in the soil or on the sur plant surface. That's colloidal chemistry. You could take this experiment, that's basically steel wool ground up very fine and you can ignite it with a Bunsen burner. The same weight of, of steel in the nail, of course you can't ignite. The only difference is the surface area. That's the only difference that allows it to be what? Combustible. So what we're saying is surface area in the form of colloids create opportunities for biology and chemistry to, to occur. Now this is right out of the college textbooks, The Nature and Property of Soils by Brady and Weil, up to the 17th edition now. How big is your soil? Now, <clears throat> what they say in that, soil, in that soil book is that clay range is that if you have a, a, a soccer field and you go down five feet and half of that total earth mass is 50% clay, roughly, that the surface area of that soccer field five feet deep is the size of the continental United States. A cubic inch of clay is seven and a half acres of surface area. Now that could be <clears throat> a great thing or it could be a nightmare if you have non-living soils that are loaded with no humic materials, no root systems, no airification opportunities. It's just clay. That's a brick. So what do we want is we want, clay is like a, a deck of cards. So what you want is that deck of cards to open up like a bellows, like an accordion. And once you open it up and you fill it up with organic materials like humic materials, you get a marriage between humic materials and clay, now you're singing. You know, now, now you're getting somewhere. So clays are <clears throat> extremely important because they're silicates, and silicates store information. If we're talking about biological systems communicating and storing information, clays are the semiconductors in your soil. This is out of the New York Times. Can assemble in varied shapes. Many domains of disorder from isomorphic substitutions. All that means is it's plastic. It means that clays can actually interfere or substitute for things that are missing. Um, and I think this is where uh, Louis Curvon's work actually is steeped in, this idea of transmutation of elements based on electricity and, and all kinds of opportunities that exist in this electromagnetic field that clay creates. Clay moistened with water, solvents, irradiated, fractured, will emanate ultraviolet light and other light wavelengths up to years. And I'll get into this soon here with the photomultiplier that uh, Fritz Albert Pop has developed to measure what? Light communication. So this is basically a computerized <coughs> replication of what fractal infinity can look like. This little square here is replicated with this thing right here. It goes on and it goes on and it goes on. So nature has an opportunity to be incredibly creative within the confines of, of limitations that it has. So here's where the rubber meets the road. The root tip exudates, this is with the Dittmer work, you know, out of the University of Iowa in the 30s. What you see here are tremendous numbers of bacteria being fed, now this is protein, which is nitrogen, being fed by a whole suite coming out of that root system. And so it, 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 it replicates what goes on everywhere. In animals, this is the villi of the intestine. Here's unhealthy villi, here's healthy villi. The same models are repeated over and over again in biological systems. Most importantly about building root systems is if that 50, 60% of what we're making up in the top canopy can dump down in the basement. Well, now we're talking about <clears throat> actually having an opportunity to take sunlight, crystallize it, liquefy it, and put it where you want it, you know, down in the basement. So the rhizosphere, the root ball, we call the nectar of the roots. We're always looking at the nectar of blossoms, but the nectar of the roots, very complex stuff. It's one of the reasons why you can take good soil, put it up to your nose, and you can smell the aromatics, the terpenes, the phenols. These are the same things you find on the leaf, or in the bark, or in the blossom. These aromatic compounds are dumped into the root system like they are also uh, dumped into the atmosphere to attract pollinators. Nucleotides, fats, mucigels, all kinds of stuff, very complex material. It's only one, one to five percent of the soil volume. Therefore, it's really important to understand why you need the thick sward, because the rhizosphere is very, very uh, confined, the root ball. Uh, the rhizosphere is no more than five millimeters from the root surface, and the microbial population is 10 to 100 times higher there than the other soil. And this is interesting to me. Microbes only occupy 7 to 15 percent of the actual root surface. So where are they living? Go back to that little photograph of that root ball. It's right around the edges. 
where all the food is being dumped, right there. So that means lots of roots, lots of rhizosphere, lots of rhizosphere, lots of sunlight getting liquefied into all these other compounds dumped into the basement. And organic compounds are very complex, as you can see up here. Many, many things other than sugar, fats, lipids, carbohydrates of many kinds, tannins. If you see a stream, in my neck of the woods we have autumn, the deciduous leaves fall off the trees, they end up in the streams, and they actually turn the streams tan, like tannin, right? Tannins are very purifying. Very, they're very, very powerful cleansers. And this is the stream's way of cleansing itself at the end of the summer. Mucigel, the lubricants that protect the roots from drought. Lots of mucigel means more drought resistance, and mucigel is also a lubricant allowing roots to penetrate deeper. And this is just some of the things that are in mucigel. A very complex carbohydrate amino acid profile there. So glomalin is produced by the mycorrhizal fungus, which in, inhabits 90% of the Earth's plants, root systems. And this was discovered, believe it or not, by Dr. Sarah Wright, USDA, 1996. That's how little we know about glomalin. And this is the compound that represents an average of 27% of the soil carbon, which is an exudate, a secretion from a fungus. 27%. It's as high as 40%. That's an amazing, and when I was just into this work about 30 years ago, I never could figure out, never could figure out why somebody who abused their soils with monocropping, no cover cropping, lots of hard chemistry, and you go to that soil every year and test it, and it was still 2% organic matter. <clears throat> so Albert Schatz is the guy who invented streptomycin. He wrote this book in 1954 and another one in 1963, Chelation as a Biological Weathering Factory in Soil Formation or Pedogenesis or the importance of metal binding phenomena in the chemistry and microbiology of soil. The first book wouldn't even be published in the United States, he had to publish it in India, right? This is the guy who dis discovered streptomycin, which is an actinomycetes secretion, which became a powerful, effective human antibiotic. So this flashes back to some of the work that was done by uh, other individuals looking at the explorations of Hiram Bingham, who was a U.S. senator and an uh, academic up at Harvard and Yale, Machu Picchu in Cusco, where the Cusco fortresses, when they're looking at these walls where the blocks weighed anywhere from 20 tons to 300 tons, they couldn't figure out how they put these blocks together without any mortar. And they couldn't even get a penknife in, in the crevasses between the, and the stones. And there was a, an English explorer <clears throat> that actually came up with the theory that they think it was what the pedo bird does. And the pedo bird uses this plant called the Haraaka ama plant to basically take it and pound it into the rock, the basalt rock cliffs, and carve out a, a nesting cavity. <clears throat> and the reason why he found this out is because he ended up traveling through a field of this plant, not knowing what it was, and the spurs on his boots dissolved. And when we got to the other side of this field, he asked the natives what happened to his spurs, and they asked him if he went through a field that had plants that had these red pigments to it, and he said, yes, and they said, the plants ate your spurs. And they found out that the pedo bird <clears throat> uses this plant to actually chelate, okay, softens the clay, or softens rock, hard rock, into a clay, so they can actually carve a hole out of, this, out of this rock. They think that's what the Inca has used, to soften the rock so they can actually cut them with the tools. They didn't have diamond tip blades, you know? Lichen is an example of that. This is a chelating compound. 36% of the dry weight are chelators. You see them everywhere. Primitive plant, it's an algae and a fungus marriage, is what it is. The algae fix uh, sugar from sunlight, and the lichen <coughs> fix minerals from the rock. You know, are also produced by compost, but they're also produced by natural soil systems. What we know with humic acids is they're chelating agents. So everything out here that's how do we get minerals into a solution is with chelating agents. So we have things like glomalin, we have things like humic acids, and humic acids actually were discovered as an agricultural boon because they were used in the oil industry to open up salt domes in the wells. Because when they hit the bit, when the bit hit the salt dome, I should say, they would wear out. So they throw humic acids in there, it would flocculate the salt, chelate the salt, soften the salt, just like that pedo bird did, and allow those bits to get through those salt domes. Found out, well, maybe you can actually sequester and chelate salt deposits from sodic irrigation water, and sure enough, it works. But nature makes humic acids constantly, as it does make fulvic acids. And you can stabilize all of these soluble anions, like boron and iodine and selenium and chromium and nitrate, with humic acids. Clays don't hold on to negatively charged substances, because clays themselves are negative. So here's a humic acid, it's what we call amphoteric, meaning it can hold on to positive things, it can hold on to negative things. Therefore, humus is the ultimate, ultimate substance you want in the soil. 
Fritz Albert Popp, this guy is um, worthy of probably several Nobel Prizes in my opinion, but he was a guy that was talking about mitogenic resonance. And he was a guy that's measuring photonic emissions. And he says that life forms communicate with light, photons. And what he's, he has a, a device that he invented called the photomultiplier that can actually measure these things. And in this case, mitogenic resonance, they did <coughs> pig's blood in uh, quartz crystal tubes, uh, infected the blood with an <coughs> organism that created antibodies. And as long as they had those tubes close enough to other tubes, antibodies were created in the non-inoculated tubes as well. This is communication, right? We know that this goes on all the time in the plant kingdom. Paramagnetic rock, I'm sure everybody's heard of paramagnetic rock, thanks to Phil Callahan. But they could measure paramagnetic rock alone at two to 4,000 photons. If you mixed it with compost, it ramped up to 400,000 photons. So a living substance with a geological substance that has light and life in and of itself, it, it, there's an exemplary jump in the photomultiplier effect, the light's coming out of that. So what we call this is quantum coherence, an orchestra of many instruments but one sound. And we see this all the time in schools of fish called wave resonance. It's communication going on, a wave of birds or a wave of fish turn on a, on a dime. They don't have to like holler from the front to the back. Hey goose, you know, making the left up here? It's automatically done, everybody knows. John Todd, He's a, a, um, an individual, he's a bioremediator at the University of Vermont, communications is self-evident in nature with this device that he called the living machines. I don't know if you've ever heard of the living machines, but he is remediating toxic wastewater with this basically uh, artificial, if you want to call it, marsh. And so what he has here is, this is the worst water and it's going downstream. By the time you get to the bottom, you see there's higher plant forms living there. And all of these tanks are all interconnected with tubing so that the fluids in every tank is able to communicate to all the other tanks. So everybody knows downstream what's coming. And they react to the toxins accordingly. They actually, the plants, the microbes, the fungi, the mollusk, everybody makes adjustments. And you actually can go to a Superfund site that actually has these huge amounts of poisons or municipal sewage treatment plants and completely eliminate all the crap that's coming out of them because nature does it best. So quantum coherence says this, subatomic particles cooperate, they know each other, they communicate by link bands of electromagnetic fields, you can measure them with this photomultiplier that Pop developed, and basically cancer patients, for example, he said, have lost their coherence and their rhythms. Lack of communication. Water is the mediator between heaven and earth in terms of communication. Archimedes' principle shows this, buoyancy, how, how a rock can actually be lifted in a stream is based on the forces of water defying gravity. The movement of water upwards through a vascular system is the Archimedes principle. We have gravity working you know, to break down hard materials, and we have the vascular system of plants relying on the Archimedes principle to defy gravity. So we have water as a sensitive organ, as sensitive as the organ as the ear. And as a consequence of that, it's a communication device for all of nature. And since the planet is a watery planet, soils are watery, plants are watery, humans are watery, cows are watery, water is watery, you know, it's important to understand what this communication is based on, so it must pulse for, for it to be alive. What does that look like there? Flow form, yeah, but it isn't. It's actually a photograph of water uh, with um, Theodore uh, Schwank's uh, work and Jennifer Green's work. They can actually measure by putting in dyes in water and watching it move and then having it come out like that. That's, the that's what flow forms really do, is they actually reenact, recreate what water pulsing actually does. The rise and fall of sap, the pulsation of blood in animals is based on rhythm. So isn't it interesting that water can dissolve things that take tremendous amounts of, of pressure to crush? And silica is the number one element in the Earth's crust, and I always say never ignore the elephant standing in the living room. That's the thing you don't really want to pay attention to. Yeah, that's the thing you do want to pay attention to. We take it for granted. And silica is found at the interface of the physical realms of gases and liquids, and it's a governor of light, and it's an attractant of water. And interestingly enough, when you get biology to operate on silica, which most people think is sand, you create this wonderful substance called monosilicic acid, or orthosilicic acid, which creates the cuticle, the strong cuticle that gives you fungal disease and, and, and insect resistance. This thing here is interesting in terms of the water, the California smelt, an astronomical exactitude. So just follow me through this. They spawn at highest tide the third day after the full moon. 
And so they're carried to shore on the last highest wave. The adults return to sea on the next wave, which is the receding tide. Fourteen days later, the highest tide rise again. And then the eggs hatch minutes before being swept out to sea. There's only one minute of the year relative to the positions of sun, moon, and earth suitable for that phenomena to happen. One minute out of the whole year. So this is how nature works. So humans, too. Just, just, we breathe at 18 times per minute, which is 25,920 times a day. There's 25,920 years of vernal equinox to circle the whole zodiac. We have 72 heartbeats and 18 breaths per minute, which is a 4 to 1 ratio. And sound travels four times faster in water than air. You know? It's, it's, I find this interesting, and I'm wrapping it up with this whole soil carbon thing. If we think about soil carbon, you know, and this is the things you heard yesterday, so I'm not going to belabor it, but I keep emphasizing if we can increase our bulk density, you know, at 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter for every 1% increase in organic matter, this is conservative. I mean, what I heard yesterday was 100 and, like 40, 160,000 liters by, what, increasing it 1% organic matter? So this is a, a real conservative number, but I use this number because nobody believes that other number where I live. They don't believe it. So I say, let's be real conservative. We're talking 18,000 gallons per acre just by coming up with 3% 3, 3 of organic matter. Guys, it's mostly guys in the audience. So loss of humus, you know, means a loss of water. Okay, all right. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Right.